Okay, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our latest INI roundtable discussion. Very excited to have so many of you guys back again. And um, so this time, focusing on repairs and construction, uh, we have a lot of the same panelists. You'll recognize their faces. And to do a, a quick reminder, there's a Q&A button, bottom center of your screen on the Zoom. We'll be taking questions from you guys this whole time. Nothing is pre-planned. We don't know what the questions will be. We want to hear from you, though, and make sure we get your questions answered. Turn off your cell phone ringer. Put your cell phone to the side. Take a break. Enjoy this conversation. At the end, if you need a PDH, you can send me an email. I'll give you guys my email address. The web webinar is being recorded, and it's one hour long with no back bathroom breaks. Uh, at the one hour mark, I will let you know in case you've got other meetings so you can head out and do them. But if we have additional questions, if you were at the last webinar, I think we ran like 20 minutes past the hour because there was just so much great dialogue amongst our panelists and our participants. So an overview, simple, I'll introduce the panel, I and I repair questions, uh, we'll do a wrap up, but I wanna get things started with a poll question. In fact, there'll be a few poll questions that we'll have throughout this uh, round table. And when it comes to the poll questions, first one, we really wanna get an idea of your experience out there, your experience with I and I. So uh, you should see a question up on your screen right now. We'll give you 15 seconds to answer, and there's a bunch of different options there. Uh, anything from at the very top, nothing yet when it comes to experience with I and I, all the way down to, this is one of my favorites, you've done all these things and you should be on this panel. <laughs> so it always makes me laugh. Actually, last time we had, I think, four different people in our audience who were very well versed when it comes to I and I things. And two of them were from EdTech. So, I mean, we've got a bunch of EdTech people on the panel right now. Turns out there's a whole bunch of them still in our office uh, that have a lot of good experience like this. So two more seconds. Uh, if you can fill in your answers, we'll end the polling. Take a look at the results there. And okay, I'll end the polling and I'll share the results with everyone. So it looks like a variety of things. Uh, many who haven't done anything yet, a uh, bunch of different things, grouting and sealing manholes, easy do-it-yourself stuff. Oh, wow, okay. Uh, and, <laughs> and it looks like six different people out there have done all sorts of repairs like these and they wanna be on our panel next time. So very, very cool. <laughs> so thanks for participating. We'll have a few more polls throughout just so we can get a sense of your knowledge and what's most important to you guys out there in the audience. So, getting started, I want to introduce my panel. Uh, we'll start with Ed Petrosky. Ed, give us a hand raise if you can. <laughs> Ed is NTEC's Director of Technical Services with more than 40 years of experience from the operators, engineers, and owners side. Brian Killian, he's been with NTEC for 18 years now. Uh, currently has the lead with the sales and marketing team for water and wastewater, and he's a certified wastewater operator, a PE, and he's one of NTEC's principals. Uh, Mike Sassaman, hand raise, yeah, there's Mike. He loves getting down and dirty with the operators out in the field. He's been with NTEC the past five years as a senior project manager. And one of our newest employees is Eric Moore. Eric's a total package. He's an engineer, he's an operator, he was a consultant and a recent utility manager, and he's now working with Dentech as a project manager. We're also very lucky that we've got a lot of friends out in the industry, so we've asked three of them to join us on this webinar today. First one is Bill Frieda. Bill is the general manager of USG, that's Utility Services Group, with over 20 years of experience. Next panelist is Mark Miller. Mark's a sales manager at Exeter Supply Company out of Warnersville, Pennsylvania. He also has 20 years of experience in the industry. And we also have Jim Clark. Jim is the president of Mr. Rehab and he coordinates the investigation of wastewater collection systems. He also has 20 years of experience, not just at Mr. Rehab, but spent 19 years at uh, another uh, engineering firm. <laughs> So uh, welcome panelists. And as I mentioned, we will be welcoming questions from our audience. So, so far, 
we don't have a question yet. We simply have a comment, which is very sweet. Um, this is from Heath Edelman, and he says, is it me, or does Ed Petrosky keep getting better looking with age? Fine <laughs> <laughs> wine. <laughs> wow. How much you paying for that one, Ed? <laughs> I love you, too. <laughs> and that's very, very sweet. But uh, how about I'll kick things off with a question. Uh, and this is something I'm always curious about when I'm dealing with storage tanks. In fact, I almost forgot. Yes, I am the storage tank queen and your moderator today. So a uh, question for the panel. I'll start with you, Brian. When it comes to INI rehab, how do you know whether you should be re repairing or replacing? Uh, that's actually a really, really tough question, to be honest with you. It, it relies upon a lot of different variables, and people think it's a real simple question, but you got to start looking at things such as, you know, how many laterals you have on the main line, you know, is it relatively straight? Do you have any sags? Uh, what do the manholes look like? What are, you know, what's the road condition? Is it 20 feet deep in a state road or is it in a four feet deep in a, in a you know, grass right away? So that's actually a really tough question. And I was joking and I talk about I and I and asset management as an art form, uh, more so than a hard science because there are so many different variables. Anyone else want to weigh in? I, I would say that, oh, sorry, I, don't remember, oh. I tell people to, <laughs> Start with the easy question is, is way the cost of rehab versus, that's where you start, the cost of rehab versus replace. And then after that, obviously that's not the simple answer, but that's where you start. Then you start to bring in the other factors of sort of the unknown cost of where's the line located, how much inconvenience is, all the other things that sort of play into the total construction cost. And that sort of guides you in the direction you might need to go. Excellent. Eric? You to, to really look at your big picture as well. So, <clears throat> you know, is DP chewing on your backside about your I&I &I problem? How bad is it? Are you in triage mode? Uh, what's your budget? So a lot of the small systems that I've dealt with over the years uh, essentially didn't have the budget to do a lot of replacement work, but they had big I&I &I problems. So at that point, you're just triaging the system and trying to get the big stuff out. So the, the rain dishes, you know, those sorts of potential big impact, um, small cost items, those sorts of things. And then uh, it gets more complicated as you go. Once you start to take the flow, the I and I out, then you get into those really detailed questions of uh, how much can I afford? What's the biggest bang for my buck? And that's why you need to have a comprehensive program, not just a stab in the dark. So you've got to be doing some flow metering and some flow chasing and some other things to make sure you're spending your money in the, the proper fashion. Excellent. Too many people wait until they have a big problem instead of being proactive and doing it as a maintenance type thing on an ongoing basis. Does that tie in at all with that? What's that report with the three numbers? I'm forgetting what it is. Chapter 94. Oh, <laughs> I'm a water person. <laughs> that was a good guess, Mike. I never would have got that. I'm like, three numbers. I'm like, man, I don't know it. At 537. <laughs> yeah, right, there you go. There you go. Does it tie in with that um, that, re well, that report? It can. I mean, if your Chapter 94 report tells you you're hydraulically overloaded, it's typically because of I&I, &I, and uh, you need to do something about it. And it's a five, it looks five years ahead, so it should start telling you when it's coming rather than waiting until DEP tells you you have a problem and now you have to do something about it. Yeah. I know I use the Chapter 94 as, as kind of like a quick and dirty guide if your INI is excessive. When I look at flow per EDU, once that starts going 400, 500, I'm like, wait, yeah. you guys you guys have a problem. Yeah. Now, what, what does that mean, flow per EDU? So it's how many gallons per day they are seeing at the wastewater treatment plant per equivalent dwelling unit? And it's a very nebulous term in the industry, but <laughs> EDU. Okay, excellent. Hey, a question that often comes up is when you're doing these repairs, how do you know if they're being done correctly? So who ha is there an easy answer to that? I heard an inspector on site. <laughs> <laughs> is everyone saying the exact same thing? <laughs> so I'm hearing well, the words. Let me, let me just say, I think it's important, no matter how qualified your contractor is uh, or how good his reputation, I think it's important for the owner to have his own inspector on that site 
of watching what's going on. But the other thing is, this internal work is really kind of specialized. So your inspector should be very familiar with this kind of work. You know, don't just hire Joe down the street because he knows how to do plumbing. This is pretty specialized stuff. And your inspector should be well qualified. And I realize that drives the price up, but you're investing a lot of money. You want to get it done right. You want to be verifying that it's getting, everything's getting done that's supposed to be done and it's being done right. So I think you, you just need a good qualified inspector out there. Uh, and then in the end, if you did know how much, say, infiltration you had coming from a particular line or group of lines, if you can remeasure it that way, that's great. A lot of people don't do that because it's difficult. But that's another thing to do. How good does it work? But that that's a tough one to, to do, actually. So it's a bigger, bigger picture question. So when we tried to tackle things at West Branch Regional Authority, where I, I was the, the director, we tried to do it neighborhood by neighborhood instead of, you know, uh, big areas because you wanted to be able to do the laterals and the lines and the manholes and have pre-flow monitoring and post-flow monitoring so we could show it to DEP and our board and our customers and say, you know, we did everything we could in that small area and here's what happened. So our flow meter said we had a problem. Um, we went out, we fixed all the stuff. We made you poor customers fix your laterals. And all of a sudden here we do post flow monitoring and the flow is the peaks are gone and uh, we're in compliance again. So it was a very powerful way to do it, but you have to be able to coordinate that, um, that whole approach. Yes, Jim. The, the only thing that I would add in terms of QAQC, I mean, some of the standard uh, protocols to assure you're getting a proper job from any contractor, of course, the, the standard in the industry is, CCTV that almost always goes hand in hand. Uh, what is called a post rehab inspection. And uh, a, CCTV. What does that stand for? Closed circuit television, and um, and so that gives everyone a visual documentation that you can see. Um, you know uh, that the that the repair is there and that it's smooth. The transitions are smooth, and that the leakage is gone above and beyond that. Um, other things that can be done in addition to that would be like pneumatic air testing to, to test the seals. Um, can, you know, that's a, uh, a pretty normal thing as well. Um, and um, the other thing that I think is always good for any inspector or any engineer uh, to have. So I, what I can tell you as a contractor is that all these materials, we work with, you know, no contractor makes their own materials. They work hand in hand with the manufacturer. And the manufacturer has their own standards, if you will. And I'm not necessarily talking just about ASTM standards and, and specifications. I mean, we work with installation procedures that lining manufacturers provide and so forth. And one, one of the, the things that, you know, that a third party or, or, or an owner or an owner's rep representative uh, can do is just ask for those and just kind of follow them along. Because at the very least, uh, any contractor engaged in rehab should be following the manufacturer's standards and their own guidelines, particularly on things like, uh, like for lining, you'll have what we call cook sheets and um, curing recommendations. And that has to do with temperatures, times, and things like that. Maybe a, 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 a general specification won't even get to that detail because there's a range of every product's different. And so those are always, I think those are some of the, the, the things that can be overlooked that, um, you know, there's nothing like just observing a contractor follow his own procedures. And it's like, no, wait a minute, this, this is your own what, what are you doing here? It looks like you missed a step or whatever. Just explain that to me because this is your procedure that I have here. 
So th those are all the things that can contribute uh, to, to a successful outcome. Uh, Brian. And I mean, one of the biggest things is to hire a reputable contractor, number one. <laughs> Uh, number two is, is to have the inspector and the contractor speaking the same language. And I think NASCO has really helped with that, especially on the CCTV, but they even also have uh, lining installation guidelines that you're supposed to follow. Uh, I know, you know, we have people trained in that as well. And then lastly, Jim talked about that, the pre and post TV. At NTech, we actually have a year, uh, one year inspection as well a lot of times, especially in the larger jobs. One year inspection to do at least 15% uh, and if X amount, you know, fail, then they got to do another, you know, 20%. If X amount fail, then they have to do the whole system. And we have uh, cover that in our specifications pretty well and kind of leave that on the retainage for the contractor to come back after a year. Excellent. Bill, did you have something? Yeah, I was going to add on to uh, kind of along what Brian said in the beginning, Brian mentioned that, you know, or, or I think Ed mentioned that what, what we're due is very specialized. So hire a specialized contractor. You know, there's millions of contractors out there, but when you want to get the right product, you want a, a, a contractor that's got years of experience in doing that type of work, not, you know, so you guys put the qualifications in your, in your bids that it's so many feet or so many you know, hours or projects and stuff like that. That stuff is good because it's sort of setting the bar from the beginning that, you know, this is what we mean by quality. So you're setting it there and then have, the other thing I always recommend is no matter how big or small the project is, you have a pre-job conference and make sure that your contractor understands what you're actually intending for him to do. Because there can often be confusion about, well, well we only do it this way and well, we want it done this way. And um, it, it, because of so much what we do, they're specialized, you know, the specification calls out one item and they substitute something and something's not the same. And, it can get confusing as to what the end product really needs to be. And as long as both the engineer and the contractor understand what the goal is, everything goes a lot better. Product goes in better, you better chance of solving the problem. Excellent. Other comments on inspection? Okay, uh, we've gotten a bunch of questions in from our audience. So let's take a look at those right now. Um, one of them, was um, what strategies uh, do operators or engineers establish to, to, to what, what are the strategies that operators or engineers use to establish reasonable expectations for I and I results so that a board or authority doesn't lose their way or give up? So it seems like Eric, you had touched on that uh, with, with the testing and flow testing, that sort of thing. Yeah, you have to be very careful to compare apples to apples. So when you do your, your pre-flow monitoring, which I always recommend because it's part of that process of proving to your board that you're spending your money correctly. Um, you, you have a, say a three quarter inch rainfall event or an inch and a half rainfall event. When you do your post monitoring, it's tough, but you've got to try to get a rainfall event that matches up pretty well. We got lucky with our uh, first go round. We had an inch and a half event that occurred in about 25 minutes. And then, you know, three years later, it was we had an inch and a half event that was about 30 minutes. So we were able to say, this is apples to apples. We took 800,000 gallons out. Um, and you can start talking about uh, what that means per you know, gallon taken out or dollar per spent per gallon taken out. But that's the wrong approach. This is about renewing and extending the life of your resources. So you have to make sure they understand this is, you know, again, big picture stuff you're going to help that sewer line live longer. You're going to help the, the manholes live longer and you're deferring the cost of replacement as well. If that a similar time of year too, if you do it in the springtime, do it again in the springtime, not spring versus summer or fall. Levels. I think the flow metering that Eric is mentioning um, when he said they do it in a sub area, that's really very important. Some people have a tendency to just look at the flow meter in the treatment plant. And, and a classic joke I have is, and this is how boards get frustrated. We spent $4 million and we didn't see a change in the flow. Well, yeah, because your flow is so great when you get a storm that it's off the scale of the meter. So 
you remove a million gallons a day and all you did was bring yourself into the range of flow meter. So if you do it on a subsystem, you know, where we're taking a three or four blocked area and you do the metering there and you got to get portable meters and install them properly and so on. But that, that cost of doing that is golden when it comes to see what you do. And again, boards want to see, well, how much are we reducing? The other point that Eric made is you're not just reducing I and I, you're extending the life of that system. And that's a harder concept for a lot of people to understand, but it's so very, very true. Uh, you, if you can extend that life, you know, reduce that cost of replacement, you know, you're not digging and replacing, say, for example, that, that's huge. And, and it's hard to understand, but it is a huge issue. Jim, did you have something to add? I, I wanted to just, uh, well, they basically said it all. Uh, they took the thoughts right out of my head. But I, I have just, I have seen the exact same thing where boards get frustrated when um, there's a, you know, when you take too broad of a swath and you're kind of all over the system. Um, it is hard to measure at the plant and um, the focused approach and breaking into subsystems and then as uh, Eric and Ed are, are saying, you know, the component that goes with that flow monitoring gives the ability to kind of focus on specific areas. You know, the, the metering is a prioritization tool. You find out the worst areas and then um, you tackle the worst areas and it's, it's always best to stay focused on those areas I'm not I'm not saying you necessarily ignore something obvious that's somewhere else but in general terms you want to stay focused because it's easier to show the results that the ground that you're you're making um, in that context of a sub area because it's not always easy to see for quite a while at the plant um, and, and at Ed again brings up a very good point of some of the reasoning why that's so difficult. So, but that, that is very true. That's been my experience through the so years. It sounds like it's so important to be working with an engineer who really understands this, not just the little parts, but the, the big picture, the big picture and why you're getting there, those results and actually what it really means short term, long term to explain it all to your board. So uh, I'm going to move on to the next question, you guys, and I'm going to pose this one to Mark Miller. Um, do manhole liners restore structural integrity? Uh, there is uh, there are multiple manhole lining systems out there. <laughs> Some of them which will do that, and uh, the gentlemen that are in the panel are, are both using products that do that. Uh, but there's other ones that uh, do not. They they help with hydrogen sulfide. They have their their benefits for your system. Um, but it's again, it's a broad. Um, so many products out there you got to find the right ones that fit your need for your systems i think getting structural or integrity is very important especially in older manholes and uh, the guys to my uh, top of my screen uh, both know that really well and they can also share their their opinions on that too now i'm, I'm guessing that when it comes to structural integrity you're, there's more to these liners with those so would those be more expensive huh. I mean, they're, they can be more expensive, but you you're you want to have a product that works. We want to have, <laughs> if I'm going to do that in my system, I want a product that's a strong product that's going to be around for 50 years. It's going to hold up and you're going to pay a little bit more for a premium product. Uh, but I mean, I, I feel that with the market, it's very cost competitive uh, with, with all, all the other products out there. What's everyone else's experience? Jim, Jim's got a point. Jim? So, it, it, you know, in terms of manholes, I would, I would uh, categorize it into three basic categories when, when you're uh, working with manhole structures. And so, because you do, you have different uh, states of condition. So let's start with a, a precast manhole that has pretty much full structural integrity, but it's leaky because many times... Uh, you've got your structural integrity, but you'll have the barrel joints or maybe the pipe penetrations where the um, you have a breach. 
excuse me, in the seals. And so that's, that's your kind of easiest fix and, and cost is relative to these categories. And so you can go in with sealants um, many times if the leaks are small, the, 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 the uh, technicians, the maintenance staff of, of, of the boroughs and collection systems that work on these actually, you know, go to Mark and, and get some sealants that they can utilize for small leaks, bigger leaks, you, you can bring in a contractor. So you, but one way or another, it's, it's all about sealants. Then you move into, um, you know, the next category is where you've got some structural deterioration, but mostly due to age, or you may have brick manholes where, you know, they're intact overall, but, um, you know, your mortar over time might have deteriorated, you may have some loose bricks and things like that. And as long as you don't have any significant hydrogen sulfide deterioration, you know, then you can go into mortar uh, linings, uh, which uh, waterproofs and adds uh, structural integrity, um, you know, restores the structural integrity, uh, at the very least enhances it and gets it back uh, to where it needs to be. And then, <coughs> excuse me, the third category would be kind of your worst case scenario. And that's, that's where you really um, lost significant uh, structural integrity and, and when it relates to uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, deterioration, then you need the really high end uh, coatings and so forth. And, and, and of course you're into the costliest realm of rehab. Other experiences with the um, manhole liners? Anyone else? They, the, you know, along Jim's line, one thing to remember is they do provide, they are structural, some of them, not all of them, but the ones we're talking about, the structural ones, they are structural, but they're not replacing the manhole. You're rehabbing it, you're extending the life of it, you're restoring it so that it can be functional. But I think sometimes there's expectation that I've rehabbed the manhole, therefore it's a brand new manhole. It's just like if I had dug it up and replaced it and that's, that's not the case. It's not to say those issues are now all gone and it's going to, you know, because it's an active system, it's constantly changing. You're going to rehab it. You're going to get, you're going to, you're going to extend the life. Definitely. You're going to restore that, but you, there has to be some level of assessment while it's being done. Um, we've seen it plenty of times where um, we'll plan on doing a restoration and then we get down in the manhole and we raise the flag and say, there's only so much we can do. We can't, we're not replacing the manhole in the ground by just spraying stuff on the wall. So there's, there's gotta be some level of, of your, your guys that are going in the hole. They gotta be able to identify what, what is a candidate for rehab. Now, if the engineers have done it ahead of time, then that's great. They're usually pretty good at finding those. Um, but often we see times where, you know, someone wants us just to come and look at them and we look at them and we looks okay. But then after we get into it, it's like, mm, so you, you gotta you gotta know when to draw the line because it's not a full replacement; it's a restoration. Do you have to clean those manholes to really know can we rehab or replace? To 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 do the restoration, you have to clean them. To do the inspection, you don't necessarily, but there is a a level of inspection. You can do level one or level two inspections um, to sort of determine it. Um, if it's just leaking and that's all you're doing, a lot of that's done fairly easily. It's visual. Um, if you're talking about actually doing restoration, you know, it's a good idea to get down in there and poke around and, and actually get an assessment of the, of the condition before you mobilize to actually do the work. Other comments? Okay, we'll move on to the next question. Um, how long would you wait for a post CCTV inspection? I think sometimes it depends on a lot of times when you get this done by a contractor, you have a one year warranty. So you want to do it first of all, within that one year. And you want to also again, try to do it in the right time of year when there's groundwater, if that's what you're looking for, or if that's what the work that was done to stop leaks, um, you want to come back again to see that there's adequate groundwater to show that the leaks have been stopped. Other comments on that question? 
Yes, Jim. The only thing that I would add, and, and uh, you know, and, and the talk about a post, um, you know, a warranty inspection within the first year, uh, I have no dispute on that. That all makes sense uh, for quality control, but you would never forego, uh, you want an immediate post inspection. Um, you're, you're really not paying any additional for that because most all this stuff requires um, that equipment to be on site and it's, it's a standard. So it's not like you, you would choose. I mean, that, that is always a standard that you get an immediate post inspection right after repair. And then uh, owners uh, decide, engineers decide if it makes sense to do a warranty, which, um, you know, one form or another, you're going to pay additional costs for that. But obviously, uh, engineers and owners out there, many of them feel that that's worth the investment uh, to, to make sure that uh, they have a quality installation. There, there can be shrinkage in your liners. So if you put a, a cured in place liner into a pipeline and there are aggravating factors like high groundwater conditions that can leach the heat away, um, some other things that can happen, you can uh, have issues that include shrinkage. And so that, in, in my experience, has usually been within a few days, not weeks or months. So uh, pretty much if you're doing your immediate follow-up and it's the next day, uh, I might stretch that out for a week or so and say, you know, send your crew in in two weeks to do that immediate follow-up so that we can see if there's any shrinkage and you, you cut the holes remotely where the laterals come in uh, to that liner and they can move when it shrinks and cover at least partially that opening for the lateral. So you don't want to wait too long because customers uh, get a little irritated when their line backs up because their opening has been uh, closed off. Oh, well, speaking of CIP, you said that was cast in place. Is that right? Sure. Cured in place. Cured in place. Yeah. Cured in place. So next question, if we move on to that, is can you pressure test the ends of a CIP liner? For a, a full length liner, you're you're cutting holes in for the laterals. So I'm not sure if that's the what the question's geared towards. But for a, a sectional liner, uh, it's not anything I've tried. Jim, is that something that you've done? Yeah, you, you can test you can test a full length liner, but but you're right, Eric, and, and the you know the issue bringing up is is absolutely spot on. And so the way that gets done is um, you uh, when you finish the tube and you just have a solid tube is when you do the test to just make sure that the tube has integrity all the way through. Uh, and then um, once that uh, is established as a as a pass. Um, then you, you go ahead and, and uh, reinstate the laterals because at that point, you, you're exactly right. You're at the point of no return. Uh, once, once you start cutting the liner, there's, there's no going back for, for testing at that point. And then, of course, sectionals, um, um, you know, for the short liners, you can either straddle the, the repair in its entirety with, with the proper uh, test plug arrangement, or at the very least, you can do the end joints, where the critical points um, where the seals are. Uh, you can do the individual joints at either end. Other comments on this? Now, one thing I'm curious about is, do any owners do the CIP liners themselves, or is it really tricky, pain in the butt, and something you'd really mm -hmm. want to get a contractor to do? What's your experience that's been out there? Well, I, I would say we, we did some sectional liners and, and the first one I was pretty sure we were gonna have an employee permanently bonded to a four foot liner section. And so that was pretty uh, challenging for our guys. And that was just a sectional piece. I personally would not have tried any form of cured in place full length liner uh, with my own staff. And when you say sectional piece, what does that mean? Uh, it's a you instead of curing the whole liner from manhole to manhole, it's just to do a four foot section or so to cover a break or something okay. and you pull it in place and then you, you can cure it. Uh, but to get it in and down through the manhole, we had, uh, thankfully they, they listened that time and put their Tyvek suit on. Otherwise he would have been permanently adhered to the. <laughs> so. 
So it is something where guys actually crawl in and can put it into place then. Somebody's got to feed it into the, into the pipe uh, through the manhole to get it all the way in. Okay. Yes, Mark. I think some of what I've been seeing throughout my, my 20 years of doing this is that in the beginning, uh, uh, municipal authorities actually had big crews and they were trying to attack manhole rehab, um, doing sex, uh, the chimney repairs to doing the spot repairs, like Eric said, to now they're, they're, they're seeing their crews shrink every year. It seems they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And, um, you know, the Jim Clark's and then Bill's out there. I mean, this is what they do every day. This is their living. And, and we're, I'm seeing as, as a distributor side of things that we're seeing it more go to uh, the contractor side of things now. We're, and the crews are a big part of it too. And, you know, uh, it's getting stuck to yourself and all that stuff. But it's a lot of time too. It's, so it's easier point, to get yeah. to the guys like you see here on the screen and, that do it every day. Yeah. Jim? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, there are a few exceptions to the rule, and I think Mark even serviced one. Um, Dallas. Yes, and yeah. you know, there's just a few out there, but I, but it is true. The trend that Mark is is describing is true, and I think the reason behind that is, um, you know, they have dabbled in the past, but it's such when you learn the one thing you learn is what a tremendous commitment it is of resources to do it. It's nothing you can just um, kind of casually do. Most municipal um, maintenance staff, they, they rely upon them on a number, a wide range of things. And so, you know, we're talking about very specialized stuff. That's just a tremendous commitment. Um, contractors uh, sometimes work hand. The one thing I will say, I mean, we've worked hand in hand uh, with municipal uh, folks, um, whether they've contributed um, to pre-TV uh, or, um, you know, traffic control. I, I always encourage that because sometimes they're interested in how can, how can we do this and save money? Um, and so, but there is, there's clearly a trend where it's just so specialized. And the other thing is, is the regulations and safety uh, are just uh, always uh, getting more complex. And it's just, uh, and that's another deterrent as well, you know. So no question, it, it, there's not many of them left anymore. Good point. Eric? I would say when we, when we formed West Branch, the, the four communities – did not have anyone uh, staff wise that could do serious digging and fixing stuff. We always called contractors. So part of our process was let's start with small stuff. We're going to do spot repairs. There's a broken line. We're going to dig it up, fix it uh, pretty straightforward stuff. And then we moved to doing sectional repairs, 20 feet, 30 feet. Then we moved to doing manholes and full length pieces and multi-length runs every year. And that was a process that we were able to support because the boroughs needed help digging with stormwater stuff. The water authorities needed uh, help digging with the water things. So you could take that capacity, that expensive capacity of people and materials and equipment and use it and fully utilize it and get other revenue sources to help pay for it. And that's, you know, just digging stuff up. That doesn't apply with sewer specific, um, highly technical specialized stuff. So it is a lot harder to maintain those staffing levels and those expensive pieces of equipment. Yeah, Bill? Yeah, I, I just, we work with some municipalities that have the capabilities to do some of the stuff that we do, but with the staffs reducing and, and the, the startup time, every time they go to do a sectional repair, it's a, okay, how do we do this again? And, they, and, and in the end, the, you know, the, the, the powers that be realize that they can hire a contractor that can get five done in a day instead of one. Right. Or they had issues where we can't do them because once we start them, it takes three and a half hours and, and, and they get pulled away to go handle a repair or a break or something like that. So they, they can do them. And, and we see more and more that, you know, we're working alongside of municipalities that have the tools, they have the know-how, they have the people, but, it's so specialized, they'd rather stick to this, the, the run-of-the-mill stuff or the more important stuff that they have to deal with on a day-to-day -day and allow the, 
the contractors to come in and, and that can do it efficiently and correctly. Yeah, Bill is exactly correct. So you would try to put a liner in, the sectional liner, and wait the time it takes to cure. And in the interim, five guys have to go to five different places. And so it's uh, we bought a, a, a patch liner system, and it was more as a, an emergency repair system, really, than a, a, a go-to every year, fix a piece, a few pieces. It was really about, hey, that's broken, and it's under that you know, critical piece of road by the school and we don't want to dig a giant hole. Let's fix it uh, and do it as an emergency quote unquote fix and get it done rather than uh, for all the reasons that Bill mentioned, rather than try to do them every year, do several. Yeah. Good points. Excellent. Okay. Mark, um, you mentioned that um, Dallas was doing some work themselves. Is that Dallas, Texas or Pennsylvania? Dallas, Pennsylvania. <laughs> All right. They, they, um, as Jim know, I know Jim works with them. They have uh, some of the, their equipment is unbelievable. They, uh, I've never seen a municipal authority that had that kind of equipment and they spent a lot of money uh, throughout the years. And uh, they're, they're pretty dedicated to it. DEPs on them really hard every year. Um, and it's funny because I, I believe they're very proactive with uh, their I and I and DEP seems to really, uh, Stand on. That's great. They're very. I never understood that. They're always doing work up there. Yeah. But then again, they're very proactive now. You might be right. Yeah. (laughs) They have to stay busy with that. Their equipment costs them a lot of money, and um, getting the the guys. They have a good group of guys. Are lucky. They've had a crew that's been there for a long time. So, you know, it makes sense sometimes, and you know. But you don't see it often. Uh, that. Okay, excellent. We're going to do something right now that the panel has no idea is coming. <laughs> so I oh always like to mix things up, keep things fun here. And what we're going to do is a lightning round. Yay! Sounds dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> I realize I'm putting you on the spot right now, panelists, so you have the option to pass. But here's the question I'm posing to all of you, and I'm, it's something I'm very curious about. Uh, in 30 seconds or less, tell me the cheapest I and I repair you've ever seen and how much it cost. We're gonna start with Brian. Ready, go. The easiest thing to always do is to make sure that when it goes in the ground, it, new construction that it goes in right. You're paying zero on I and I. You're just making sure it's installed right the first time. Mark, Mark Miller. Uh, the cheapest repair, uh, I mean, you can put an insert in, that's gonna be your cheapest thing. Uh, and how, that's okay, kind of how much would that be? That's, <laughs> the Brian Killian price uh, <laughs> that we learned about last time, $50. $50, $50. okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, Bill. Bill, cheapest repair you've ever seen, and how much was it? Um, I'm gonna. It's. It, I'm gonna. Cause you stole mine, Mark. I'm gonna say <laughs> uh, an observation which cost nothing. We were looking at a job for a client. We popped a manhole, and we found an old CSO that was supposed to have been cut off. That was open, and the river was flowing into the system. So. It was probably not cheap, like in the grand scheme of things, probably cost them $8,000 to dig it up and fix it. However, to find it, it cost them nothing. <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Okay. And, Mike the, and the bang for the buck was probably big because it was a, a fairly large pipe flowing backward into the system. <laughs> Mike Sassaman, cheapest repair you've ever seen. Disconnect the sump pump from the sanitary sewer system. <laughs> Just take the hose out and run it out the window of the basement and and uh you're and so that's something you see in a residential home right right okay yeah you're right i guess that doesn't cost much just buy, finding it is the cost trying to find it except Jim they Clark, put it back they hook it back up next week uh along the same lines of course dishes um the, as far as biggest bang for buck than anybody can do a dish uh that have a serious overflow um clean out caps that are in depressed area that are missing yeah. Um, we've seen in storms where they, they just, uh, suck the water in, um, unbelievably and literally put a couple dollar cap on 
um, maybe one of Mark's tubes of grout that you just get, you know, um, that you, you drill a hole and just inject a, you know, a $30 tube of sealant. Th those would all be um, in, in that category. Okay. Uh, Ed, even though it says Brian Killian by your face, just a reminder, you're Ed Petrosky. Yeah, right? Thank you. Thank you for reminding me of that. I almost, you know, I'm going to go along something with Mike said and, and what Jim was saying. Um, when you get those, as I like to call them, behind the curb problems, uh, the sump pumps, the rain gutters, the leaky laterals, uh, if your rules and regs are, are tough, and your board of directors has the 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 nerve, the strength to, to enforce them. Um, those can be your cheapest repairs because that cost should fall on the homeowner. Now you do have to find them, but sometimes they're not that hard to find. So that that's the ones I like to look at. Okay, excellent. And Eric Moore, cheapest repair. Smoke testing, uh, which was a cheap. A cheap investigative tool found two uh, cases where the, the in the old days they routed a storm line through the manhole through the sanitary manhole and the storm line had a T in it and the, the T pointed up so when it filled up it would then spill into the sanitary sewer and it was an old way of flushing the sanitary sewer and so uh, with smoke testing we found those two things cut out the T's and just patched them and immediately took out almost a million gallons a day during peak events. Mm. Wow. Excellent. That's the smoking gun that everybody hopes to always find. Right. Yeah, it's a I rare found one. The elusive smoking gun. <laughs> well, thank you all. Fascinating answers. I love the stories. I hope you had fun with that because I know I did. <laughs> So back to our Q&A from the audience. Reminder, once again, if you're tuning in, uh, submit your questions, find the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We're taking those uh, the rest of the afternoon. Uh, this one's also from Heath Edelman, and uh, I'm not quite sure I understand this, but starting closer to the plant versus further into the system, what is the panel's experience with kicking water further down the system when doing the opposite? Does that, that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Who wants to address but, it? So essentially what the question is, is if you work at the upper end of the system and you seal it up real good, water will find a way to the lower part of the system. And yeah, we've, I've seen that. It does happen. It also uh, can come up through the road in, in places. It can also go into the stormwater system, into basements of houses. So it can go all over the place. So it, when I, I beat the drum on the holistic approach. You gotta, if you're an authority, talk to your borough. If they don't have storm sewer in the area, they're gonna need it because you're gonna put water into basements and those sump pumps are gonna have to go somewhere and they can't go into sanitary sewer. Other comments? Yeah, the other, other comment that I'd have is strategically place trench plugs, especially if we, that you're in right of ways to kind of stop that, that highway of water just traveling down uh, your pipe envelope. What's a trench plug? It's been essentially a, it's a clay clay dam, so water can't continue to go down uh, your pipeline. Oh. Your pipe envelope. Okay, yep, I've seen them. Jim? You know, the migration is uh, a very real problem, migration of flows, and uh, to Brian's point, um, you know, what if you picture uh, how a sewer line is installed, you know, it's – um, usually in, in uh, trenched out of uh, dense soils, clays maybe, and then uh, you, you trench it out and you put in, you know, the pea gravel and the bedding that surrounds the pipe. And what that ultimately ends up is like, uh, I would describe it as like this long horizontal French drain, if you will. And it's just a high, it's just a channel way where these groundwaters, when you start sealing, you're, you're literally changing the whole dynamics um, of underground. And um, those trenches are the, the, the channel ways uh, for all this flow to move. And so to Eric's point, uh, the holistic approach, um, and that's a great idea that uh, Brian put forth about the, you know, the, the trench plugs. If, if, I, 
if I can, um, I've used trench plugs. I've put them in, and I've even gone so far as to put relief pipes in yep. with the trench plugs. So on the upstream side or the uphill side, if you will, of a trench plug, you're coming across down a road, and there's a, there's a drainage way. Uh, you know, don't put it in somebody's front yard. Uh, I had to go to court when someone did that once. <laughs> that was ugly. <laughs> but, um, you know, you get, you're getting to that trench plug. Put one where you're crossing a small drainage way and put a relief pipe in to relieve that water into that drainage way so it doesn't keep traveling down to the treatment plant or to the next leak, which is more likely. Yeah, I just saw a note from my buddy Mark Bubel with Aqua, and he says a long French drain. That's an excellent description of the pipe bedding zone. <laughs> Love trench plugs and reliefs, as Ed Petroski suggests. Uh, any other comments on that? Okay, moving on to the next question. Can anyone discuss their experience and success with lining a sewage force main to repair a leak and provide structural integrity? Um, yes, right in my to... neighborhood, just this past year, um, there was a four inch, I believe four inch plastic force main that um, had leaked in places and been dug up and repaired in spots. And they came through with a pipe bursting. They did a pipe bursting, split that pipe apart and drug a new polyethylene pipe in behind it um, and replaced that whole force main. So that's one way to go. Um, there's some other things. It, it, it cured in place is a little tougher if it's a long, long line, um, but the pipe bursting um, is one way to go. The other way is to put a smaller pipe inside the pipe, but then you're typically losing capacity in the force main, so that's not always a good idea. Um, spot repairs when you know you have a break in certain places is typically what gets done when the pipes, when the force mains were a lot of um, ductile iron or cast iron pipe. Other comments? Yes, Jim. Just to add to that, I mean, the force mains um, are doable. Uh, there are challenges with force mains, and um, there's no question, you know, Mike uh, speaks to that. Um, you have long lengths. Many times you have multiple bends. And so a lot of times when you go trenchless, it's, it's not totally trenchless. It's kind of, um, it's a hybrid. It's, it's partially trenchless because it can be a combination of uh, strategic excavations um, along the way, or maybe at elbows and things like that to, to break it up. There are, um, you know, pipe bursting, um, uh, is definitely an option, as Mike says, and so is uh, CIPP as well. The main thing to understand is that you have to design a liner that um, is appropriate for pressure uh, as opposed to gravity. And so you need uh, liner thicknesses, resin strengths, reinforced tubes, things, those are all things you have to consider. And as well as end seals uh, that have to, to uh, either bond to that pressure, e either a chemical bond or some type of fitting that will provide you a, mecha a mechanical bond that will, again, be comparable to the pressures. Because if there's any breach in any of that, uh, you, you um, are going to get behind the liner, if you will, in that annulus and um, have problems. So it is a different application altogether. Uh, one, it's pressure. one that they did here uh, in my neighborhood had a lot of bends in it, as Jim says, um, and they dug up at a, each bend and then fused um, elbows into those ends as well. Brian? Yeah, I mean, one thing that I'm thinking of, if there's a break in the force main, uh, I started thinking about why was there a break in that force main? You know, to me, it's potentially, you know, it was an improper pipe envelope uh, or, or, or something else is going on. So I'd be a little hesitant to actually use a subsurface repair to repair a force main. I'd want to dig it open and at least take a look at it. There's a, there's a lot of potential things that could be going on there, including air entrainment issues and uh, yeah. you know, other forms of uh, 
you know, corrosion. But in general, what I've seen um, is that if the if it's a ductile iron or cast iron pipe that's breaking, it's not going to break in just one spot. It's going to keep breaking. Uh, so that tells you your host pipe has very limited structural uh, strength to lend to the process. So your liner essentially has to be a whole new pipe. If it has to be a whole new pipe, just burst it and put a new line in. And at that point, you can even look at upsizing for increased capacity in the future and those other aspects that are, are big picture. Well, I think you know, I see we're coming a... up on the hour. So I'm going to um, quickly, there's a poll I want to send out to the audience. Um, another, another poll in regards to you know what, it's not there, so you guys are in luck. <laughs> um, we're gonna do a quick wrap up, but then if the panelists can stick around, we'll, um, there's a bunch more questions that we'd love to cover and we encourage our viewers to stick with us as well. So I wanna uh, share a couple email addresses with everyone in case you wanna get in touch with any of the panelists here. And uh, so big thank you to the folks from Entech, Ed Petrosky, Mike Sassaman, Eric Moore, Brian Killian. Their email addresses are there and they, Everyone on this panel loves this stuff. So please feel free to send them an email with any questions. If you're interested in getting a PDH certificate as a PE, there is my email address. Send me a note and over the weekend, I'll get you a cert. Big thank you to uh, Bill Frieda with USG, as well as Mark Miller from Exeter Supply and Jim Clark from Mr. Rehab. So what I'll do is I will leave these names and email addresses uh, up on the screen for a couple minutes, um, but I know we can continue our discussion here. And there was uh, the next, or was there other other comments in regard to uh, the structural integrity, lining, sewage, that's the sewer mains, that sort of thing. Other comments from people? Yeah, I, if I could just add something there, and there's a lot to be said for dig and replace when you have uh, ductile iron. Um, I and I recently did one about two or three years ago, where we had a six inch ductile iron line, uh, 14 leaks, and I'm like, why aren't you guys replacing this? And we put in HDPE. Now there's a lot to be said for friction factors and hydraulics, but if you start lining an existing line without bursting it, you're ending up with a smaller cross-sectional area and it's gonna impact your flow capability in a negative way. If you go from a ductile iron line to an HDPE, the friction factors change significantly in your favor. And I was quite shocked when I replaced a six inch ductile iron with a six inch HDPE, and my sewage pumps went from operating 300 gallons a minute to 460 gallons a minute. Whoa with absolutely no change to the pumping, the wet wells, the discharge point, or anything else. Now that's a significant gain in friction head. And if you're looking at, geez, I'm kind of close on my capability, and oh, by the way, that pump station used to overflow in heavy rains, I certainly got a lot more water out by replacing the main with HDPE. A lot to be said for that consideration. It's a significant factor. Very interesting. Other comments with the repairs? Okay, uh, moving on to the next question then. Uh, how reliable are the main liners with lateral sleeves? Who wants to take that one on? That's a good controversy one, I think. Um, I've encountered different opinions over time. Personally, uh, you know, the, I will never use top hats again. I know there are other folks that swear by them. I swear at them. I uh, had a very bad experience with top hats and it, it is what it sounds like. It looks like a top hat. It gets stuck up into the, the hole where the lateral connects in and uh, supposedly bonds with your liner, but not really. And uh, we had them just essentially bunch up like, uh, you know, athletic socks right at the entry point and they just could not get them into uh, the laterals. Clearly it might've been purely a contractor issue, but in general, that's a technology I wouldn't use. But the uh, T-liners, which are essentially you know, you know, full supporting T-shape, had a little more success with them than the top hats. 
Uh, Brian, I see you're nodding your head. So same yeah, experience. I've, I've had the exact same experience. Exactly. Any other comments on that? Yes, Jim. Well, uh, as a contractor, I can tell you that we would never install a, a, a true top hat style uh, sleeve um, for for the reasons um, that these guys are speaking of. Uh, we do a, a true T liner, um, and by the way, the T liners are compliant because they're a full cylinder. They're compliant with. The ASTMs. I mean, I don't want to get too deep, but but there's a standard to support them. Let's just say it that way, a, a, a true construction standard. Whereas the the top hat style, the brim uh, does not have a, a construction standard to support it. Other comments? Okay, excellent. Um, Joe Centrone, uh, he was on earlier. He, he did say thank you, love the panel. And he also said, I agree, as a municipality, it would be hard to keep a crew busy enough to line every day and stay proficient. So it sounds like the idea of doing it yourself, uh, we're just not there anymore like we used to be. <laughs> um, another question, um, what are the first to last steps taking, taken for identifying the location of I and I, <laughs> this sounds like a very involved question. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> is I guess that's our next webinar. <laughs> I, I, I think I can do it real quickly, and this is kind of big picture stuff. But I always think about starting with number one. You start with an actual system map that that's truly quasi as built. The best system map you can start with, and then you break it up into drainage areas to break it into little pieces. And then manhole inspections are the easiest and cheapest things to do. So you do manual inspections and then you figure out, do you have inflow or infiltration? So you're looking at your plant flows to figure that out. If it's infiltration, then you got to start looking at such things as CCTV work. If it's all inflow, CCTV is going to do nothing. So then you got to start looking at, you know, low lying manholes and then, you know, potentially home inspections with roof leaders, some pumps to like. So it's a big question, but that's usually where I like to start. There's like one, piece that I, one piece that I would add to that great summary from, <laughs> from Brian, and that's, I call it flow chasing. Uh, we have a thunderstorm, you know you have inflow, you send your teams out with uh, two people on a team, you pop manholes and you just track it backwards. Try to move as quickly as you can, as safely as you can. And in general with the, you know, naked eye, you can spot where the bulk of the flow is coming from or you can realize you're totally screwed and it's coming from everywhere. <laughs> in general, it, it, the places I've done rehab work with, uh, there's always one sub area somewhere that has more flow that you can actually track back to a neighborhood or you know a series of sump pumps in a, a development where everybody got sump pumps put in the sewer, things like that. So just going out and flow chasing will tell you where to put your flow meters then your flow meters give you that data to decide is it inflow or is it infiltration and what the next investigative steps should be. I love that idea. So with, with a thunderstorm, do you go out as soon as the lightning stops? Or can you like <laughs> can you do it the next day when it's wearing raining? rubber boots? I mean, come on, that's OSHA compliant, right? <laughs> you gotta make hay when the sun shines, or in this case when the rain falls. If yeah. the, not during the lightning part, no. Um, you you want to wait till the lightning part passes. You have a, a time of concentration anyway. The water gets in the system. It's going to take time to move through the system, and you want to spot it because you're going to start at the bottom and work your way up and go to each critical joint manhole where pipes come in from the sides, and you want to be able to spot it. it is, it's hard to do when you have transitions from steep hills to flat spots and uh, being able to judge it, but in general, you do it long enough, and uh, you can tell. The one place I worked, we were on call, so uh, including the receptionist. Uh, so <laughs> you know, a of, uh, big thunderstorms roll through. Everybody had a buddy. You had to grab your buddy and your invest your inspection book and uh, keys to your car. And hopefully, it was a company car. And most often, it was not. And your rain suit, and you got your butt out there, and you you flood chased. Okay, and a comment from our audience. Apparently one owner is saying some guys I'd like to send out during the lightning with extra long hooks. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I was thinking you could wait until the next day, but you really can't. You've got to do it while that water's oh, still right. coming through then. Then about 20 minutes to half an hour, you want to be out there. 
Okay. Now that sounds like a wonderful way of checking that stuff out. Any other comments on that? I like to I like to videotape it so I would record it during dry weather and then record it during wet weather so you, so you can go back and get a, a visual of what it looked like during dry and wet. Yeah, I was wondering if I was like if you if you do it regularly, you'd get to know it, but why trust your memory? The video is a phenomenal idea. I love that. Jim, a comment? Uh, I, it's obvious that uh, I'm with a panel who is not only dedicated, but old school I and I guys, <laughs> because these, these bring me back to what we used to call night studies. And actually back in the day, we used to do a lot of it. We would literally be on call um, to spring out after a rain, but um, it's, it's, it's amazing for me to hear that it's still you know, it's still being done and still being supported. Uh, we have the evidence right in, in, right in our panel. But there are challenges with that from a contractor's, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult to be just ready on the hand. I think it's good to do. We like to work. Those are the types of things we like to work with the owners and uh, maybe support them, uh, you know, on the peripherals. But uh you know, it, it is a challenge, but there's no question as far as quality results and the way, you know, there's nothing like finding I and I in, in real time action. And, and that is uh, a, a great way to do it. If you can coordinate it and if you have the people that are dedicated enough, willing to be on call and really spring into action. But that, that's impressive stuff, man. Hats off to you. <laughs> I love it. Like sometimes the old way is one of the best ways. So I love hearing that is still happening. Okay, we've got I, one more I question think, from. I'm sorry. I go ahead. It's Ed. an effective use of your authority, manpower, though. Yeah. Now Jim is right. It's hard as a contractor to give that response, but as an authority with some trained people, you can get out there. I like to say it's why we put manholes in the ground so you can open them up and see what the hell's going on in the system. And get out there, take some notes, take some pictures, take some video like Brian's saying, and, and you can find out a lot during a rainstorm. And been doing it for a long, long time. Bill? And that's I'll add in and you can once you do that, you use your, your authority people to find it. And that's when you would hire afterwards, you narrowed it down to the biggest area. Then you get your contractor in and go and actually look for it and, and get eyes on it with a camera. We have yeah. several municipalities that we know kind of where it's coming from and they put us on call, if you will, that if we get an extended period of a rain, we might be able to schedule it to come out when it has been raining for a couple of days um, where we know it is and then we can actually see it in action. So it's not, there are some valuable things that the municipality can do on their own, Absolutely, on, yeah. sorry, on their own. not necessarily the repairs, but it's, it's some of the um, research, some of the investigation ahead of time. It's fabulous. Okay, we've got one more question from our audience. So let's hit that. Is the industry moving away from grouting of manholes? What are you guys seeing out there? Grouting is usually done to stop the flow of water. And then you do some kind of repair work after that, which Jim or Bill can speak to better. But grouting is still a good thing to stop the flow of water. Jim? You know, grouting has its place. You know, I, I don't know that, that you would say that we're moving away from it, but I think there is um, a realization, you know, as people become more uh, engaged with the process and more knowledgeable of the process. Yet, yet grouting has its place, but number one, you have to remember it's a sealant and it's not a structural repair. So you, you can't take a grout and just say, well, that's, is, that's just as good as, as lining a pipe. They're, 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 it, it's the difference between day and night. And, um, but they each have their place. You know, you have uh, these, some of these rehab repairs are structural, and so you use them when you need the structural um, enhancement and bring in uh, all that back into place where you don't have it. But you can use the grouts when you have the structural integrity and you just, and, and, and you got leaky joints and things like that. Um, we, we, use we use grouts way. also for just groundwater management prior to um, installing liners. It's a, it's a great thing to use. 
Eric? We, we use grout all the time in, in preparation of doing structural repairs because you have to get that groundwater under control so that you can properly install your structural restoration. We had our employees trained to be able to do that grout work, um, knowing that we were going to come back to those manholes and do something else. But if we had a, a, a pisser coming in at three gallons a minute and DEP had us under consent order and uh, a connection ban, so that three gallons a minute might get us an extra EDU that we were allowed to connect. And so we said, we trained the guys and said, just mark where you're, keep your good notes and we'll keep it in our GIS system as to where we did the grouting work and uh, we'll come back and check and see if it's leaking somewhere else in there later. But mostly, you know, we know that that means that that manhole has some kind of structural problem or will have some kind of structural issue most likely. And uh, we need to do some kind of structural fix with that. Cool. Any other comments on the grouting? Okay, that takes us through our questions for today. I uh, want to wrap up a couple comments from our audience. Uh, Marilyn Barron said, great seeing all of your smiling faces. I know she knows many of us here. And another comment from Heath Edelman, um, Ed Petrosky is much more handsome than Brian, although at one point Ed cl claimed Brian as his son. So <laughs> Can we get a poll up on that? <laughs> no. Create a poll no. on that. So I want to thank all my panelists. You guys were phenomenal. I love hearing your stories. I want to thank everyone in the audience who stuck around. Another 15, 20 minutes just to learn more. Uh, Mark, did you want to say something? I do. I want to take the chance to thank you. You do a great job running these Zoom. Absolutely. Absolutely. And yeah, I, sure. I've had many people respond to me after the first one saying how you run this. And I, I wanted to let everybody know that you do a Thank great you. job. Thank you. I, you. I love doing it. I love learning. You're natural. We can I, love, I love learning from the best in the business. So magical things happen when you bring together passionate people. And so thank you all. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. I'll see you guys.